Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about my background and why it is that I think that they wanted me to kind of give an overview on brain injury. So my name is Karen McAvoy. I am a clinical psychologist and a school psychologist by training. Um, worked for 20 years with Cherry Creek School District as a school psychologist and coordinator of mental health. And, and then in 2010, left Cherry Creek Schools to go open the Center for Concussion with Rocky Mountain Hospital for Children. So I directed that clinic for about um, seven and a half years and then just recently moved up to Fort, Co uh, Fort Collins to direct the concussion and neuro health clinic at Burkana Rehab Institute up there. So I've been doing brain injury for probably 20 something years through Cherry Creek, um, but specifically doing concussion work in the last 12 to 14 years um, since all of all of that has kind of come to, to play. And, and I accidentally fell into concussion by being the psychologist at Grandview High School when Jake Snakenberg passed away from concussion. Do you guys remember that in 2004, if any of you were in town at that time? So we had a, fo a freshman football player at Grandview High School who had a concussion and then um, subsequently the next week took another hit to the head and then he passed away. And I just happened to be the psychologist at that school and that's how I got into the field of trying to um, prevent concussion um, and do treatment so that we don't have that happen again. So that's my background. I'm also a part-time employee for the Department of um, Education with my colleagues here. I'm going to show you guys a little bit of what we're working on across the state for school districts and parents and um, um, child protective services. I mean, just really try early childhood, trying to get um, our colleagues who work with kids um, who are in um, at risk in different situations to just be knowledgeable about brain injury and how we can support it through some of the trainings. Um, so I'll introduce a little bit of that and then have Department of Ed tell you a little bit more about what we're doing there. Okay. All right, so that's my background. So my job today was to give you just a little overview on brain injury. So I apologize that it's not going to be as much in depth, but with a small group like this, if you have questions, feel free to just stop me and, and ask, and we, you know, hopefully we'll get to that. To, and it's nice to know sort of where you're all coming from, because then I can gauge it a little bit towards what your, what some of your questions might already be. So I'll start with just an overview of what is brain injury. So we're talking today about um, traumatic brain injury, um, and so the definition of that. <laughs> Um, we always break that down to acquired brain injury versus traumatic brain injury. And the important part about the definition of brain injury and the work that these folks all do here is that we're today specifically talking about um, any child or adult who had normal development of the brain in utero. So we're not talking about um, intellectual dif uh, disabilities or congenital disabilities. We're talking about a normally developing brain in theory, a normal birth, some period of time with normal development, and then after birth, and however long, it could be two years, it could be 30 years, you have a then some kind of an injury to the brain, which then causes a change in work, play, all those various things, right? So any kind of injury to the brain after birth is called an acquired brain injury, and that can include um, like la la um, lack of oxygen to the brain, like near drowning, um, or it can also um, involve any kind of an external blow to the head, like we're talking about with concussions, motor vehicle accidents, that kind of thing. Um, traumatic <coughs> brain injury is specifically then the brain injury after birth that is caused by an external blow to the head. So there has to be some outside force that's caused the traumatic brain injury. So you can see that all, all brain injuries after birth are called a acquired brain injury, but the external blow to the head is specifically the traumatic brain injury. And that's important in terms of funding and all of that that this office works with. Um, as you guys are listening to the presentations <coughs> and the research that we're talking about today, Keep in mind that a lot of the same things that work to support therapies or help people with traumatic brain injury help all folks with acquired brain injury regardless of how they get their injury, but there are differences in funding and specific requirements that 
makes it so that school districts keep those separate and funding agencies keep those separate and different. Is there a question? Is cerebral palsy considered a brain, an acquired brain injury or is it its own little category? It's not technically considered an acquired brain injury per se. There's some debate about there, there's some controversy about there, there's a lot of discussion about that, but not, you guys are not really necessarily keeping that in the category of brain injury, am I right? Yes. So I would say no. Um, partially because also with some of these different kinds of disabilities, there are um, supports and interventions that are gonna be much more tailored to like cerebral palsy than brain injury supports. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Anything you wanna to add to that? No, perfect answer. Okay, good, all right. So we're talking about any kind of injury to the brain after birth, and then specifically we're talking about traumatic brain injury today. So when you talk about traumatic brain injuries or acquired brain injuries, so keep thinking widely, but also think narrowly, um, the categories that generally medical people break that down to is mild, moderate, and severe. When I'm in the clinic, what most of the parents come in and ask me is, how severe is this concussion? Um, can you give me kind of a label for it? So we're gonna use those categories here for you guys, but also keep in mind that a lot of, you know, our medical doctors, when they talk about mild brain injury um, versus severe brain injury, they're kind of talking about kind of medical classifications. And that doesn't necessarily translate to some of us who work in the wor world of work, in the world of schools, because it's not the same functional outcome. So when you talk about a mild brain injury, it's often called to, it's often called or referred to as a concussion, right? A concussion is a brain injury. Um, I know that that, you know, has been, that's something that we haven't, you know, in the field of concussion, we tend not to focus a lot on that, but a concussion is a brain injury. Question? <clears throat> well, when you're talking about um, traumatic brain injury, I know some of the new research has been looking at um, mini, mini hits, mini concussions, and how they can add up then exactly. to a form of mild or moderate. Exactly. And so I didn't see that on there, and I was like, I mean, I'm, I'm interested in how that fits in. Exactly. Into this. Like, so, so there's question, there's new research going on, right, with football players and all about sub-concussive so multiple yeah, right. hits to the head that don't even add up to an actual diagnosis of a concussion, and what's the <laughs> cumulative effect of that? So. You're absolutely right. Um, so uh, I'll go through the definition and then we'll start putting it all together, okay. okay? So the reason I start with these definitions is because you'll kind of, you know, you'll, people like things in categories. So it's easier to say, okay, mild traumatic brain injury versus severe traumatic brain injury. But you're, but you're gonna see here in a few minutes, it isn't quite that easy because exactly for those reasons that there's a lot more that we're learning about the cumulative effects as well as the, um, you know, the functional outcomes. So in theory, a mild traumatic brain injury is what we hope a concussion is. It is a hit to the head that causes a short-term transient um, flaring of symptoms, you know, physical, cognitive symptoms, emotional symptoms, but we hope that those last only days to weeks. 70% of kids with a concussion will resolve from their concussion in 28 days, so four weeks. So we're hoping that that isn't a long-term impact. Now, many of you already shared you're here for personal reasons where that's not necessarily that you're falling in that category. So we already know, even though the research is showing that overall a hit to the head that is, quote, a concussion, and we hope it's mild, doesn't always turn out to be that way functionally. But the big difference with a concussion is it tends to be a functional injury. It tends to cause problems for people with symptoms of headaches and dizziness and sleep and work and play, and it's not a structural injury. So if you were to do a CAT scan or an MRI of the brain in the case of a concussion, which in theory a mild brain injury, you would not see anything on a CAT scan or an MRI. And that's because a concussion is an injury to the cell, not to structures of the brain. So that's kind of the difference. So there is functional concerns, but generally not structural. Now, if you go to the other extreme, a severe brain injury, those are generally not so hard to see, right? This is maybe a case where somebody um, was doing fine, they had a motor vehicle accident or fell off their skateboard, 
and really had a very serious injury, perhaps one that you can actually see parts of the skull are missing, they had to go in and do surgery, they're generally in children's hospital for a while or in some kind of a medical setting. Um, and if you were to do a CAT scan or an MRI of their brain, you would actually <laughs> probably see structural damage. There are parts of the brain that may be missing or different now. And there are probably functional outcome problems. They're not working as well, they're not thinking as well, they're not processing as quickly. So with someone with a severe brain injury, those folks hopefully are the ones that are coming to our attention right away, right? Going to the hospitals and getting rehab services and being carefully, um, you know, um, transitioned over from the hospital into school districts and transitioned over to DVR for work support and all of that. So those folks are not so hard to see. The ones that I think are really the hardest is kind of that moderate le level of brain injury. Those are the ones in between where perhaps we thought, okay, with a concussion, you, we hoped that this person would get better, but instead of days and weeks, and now we're months or years later, they're still struggling functionally, that's probably more now considered like a moderate brain injury. Or someone who had a very severe brain injury who we were like thinking, oh, man, you know, we're, we're lucky this person's alive, they have a great recovery, and then they're kind of now falling into the moderate level. So and this is kind of the catch-all in the middle, and this kind of really gets to your question of, uh, it's not just about what it looks like at the hospital or what the discharge is, it's about the functional outcome years down the road. You have another question? So does loss of consciousness include <coughs> uh, uh, the inability to, on your short-term memory? It just depends. Loss of consciousness is not specifically related to problems with short-term memory. Um, you don't have to have a loss of consciousness and you can have problems with short-term memory. So they're kind of parallel, not necessarily related. Okay? All right. So with the moderate level, you know, you're, you may have structural diff difficulties. I think the ones that we tend to see, the ones, the people that fall through the crack that might have had an injury but just didn't get better in the time that we thought, or numerous hits to the head, numerous concussions that now you're feeling like it's adding up and it's kind of falling in the category of moderate because it's lasting longer, there's probably still functional outcome and um, you know longer term problems. So that's, so that's kind of the catch all that we talk about. Um, so basically, although we like to wrap this up and make it really easy and many of our medical doctors like to put mild, moderate, severe on paperwork that, that they send home with kids to schools and you know, they discharge a kid home to you saying, well, that was a mild brain injury. You know, the kid is walking and talking again. Um, what we know as the, the providers who take care of these kids and adults longer term is the, the severity of the injury and the label that they put on it at discharge does not necessarily equate to the functional outcome. And that's what you guys are all talking about and the reason that you're here. So the research is not necessarily lining up and saying that it's you know exactly about how the hit happened. So you know if you got hit in football, it's way worse than getting hit in cheerleading. That's not necessarily the case. And it doesn't really even correlate where the hit happened. People <coughs> will always ask me, well, where exactly did they hit their head? That will help me know where to put my interventions. That's not necessarily the case because all of the brain cells talk to each other. And so, therefore, you could get hit here, but you see different impact. You know, or you and I could go both get hit in the same part of the brain, but have different functional outcome. And it's also not how hard you were hit. So people always thought that if you had a loss of consciousness with a concussion, that was a way worse injury than if you didn't have a loss of consciousness. And that's not necessarily been what's, what's being shown in the research. Um, and only 10% of, of kids will have a loss of consciousness with a concussion. Um, and they don't necessarily have a worse outcome than the kids who didn't have a loss of consciousness. So, so while, yes, research is trying to kind of help us figure out and organize our thinking around this, we are still having to kind of think case by case and um, school by school and work situation to know how to support these people. So that's kind of the background that we start with. We obviously know that there, like Judy said, there are more adults and kids in the state of Colorado that 
um, are having um, brain injuries that are probably not coming onto our radar for various surveillance reasons. Um, but obviously, you know, 500,000 adults, I think you said 800 kids per year. Um, and we're not necessarily staffing 800 kids per year into special education because of brain injury. So, so again, as they're discharged from the hospital, we're still hoping for good recovery and not necessarily putting them on the, our radar in various ways of special education or DVR. But what we're finding then is down the road, people are still struggling and then it's hard for them to circle back and get those supports later. Um, so we're trying to really work on that piece of it. So we know there's no lack of numbers. Um, in fact, the leading cause of traumatic brain injury, if you kind of look nationally from the CDC, um, so um, who is with the Department of Aging? Yeah, you know, we know that falls um, are really high for our folks who are 60 plus years old. So a lot of brain injuries are coming from that. Um, but you can see how this breaks down. Motor vehicles is a fairly high number of traumatic brain injuries. Um, and assaults, when you look at the number of assaults, those do tend to kind of fall in that pediatric population of child welfare, foster care, adoption. Um, some of our kids where we have absolutely no idea if they actually did have um, any kind of abuse before they came to us. Um, and that's not even kind of thinking widely, which is not traumatic brain injury, but fetal alcohol kinds of concerns, um, which is neurochemical, but not necessarily brain injury per se. But so again, you can kind of think wide, but, but you know, we also kind of keep things into categories. So if you think of just traumatic brain injury post-birth, we're having a lot of kids with shaken baby syndrome. This category struck by, again, this is the concussions category now, sports kids who are getting hit in the head by other players, by balls, or by hitting the, the ground. So we have, we definitely know that we have a number, um, you know, of, of reasons why we're getting a higher number of traumatic brain injury. I think the bigger question that we all have as people that work with folks down the road or for our own kids is what is the long-term consequence? What is the sequelae? And What's the impact on their behavior, their emotional well-being, and their learning? So I'll jump into that just a little bit more. We do have some information that suggests that when you survey populations <coughs> of risk down the road and you go back and you ask them, did they have an incident of brain injury, um, you have higher numbers or you have concerning numbers where perhaps um, you know, you can begin to say, well, a brain injury early in life, did that then lead to aggressive behavior, criminal behavior? And we do tend to have some information that's suggesting they have a higher number of people in prisons um, or even in youth um, juvenile justice that maybe had a lifetime history of brain injury. So you can kind of see the percentages. We have concern that folks that um, are homeless have had some kind of an injury, substance abuse, mental health. But you have to keep in mind all of this research is after the fact. And so we don't know how many folks also had other reasons, you know, poverty or, you know, difficulty with family situations that also led to this. Maybe it wasn't the brain injury. So we, we really need to do prospective research where we follow people forward. That's really hard to do versus just tracking them, asking them after. But we certainly have enough concern by our numbers that perhaps having had a brain injury at some point in your life can set you on a different trajectory uh, of risk that we need to be aware of. So having set the stage for that, what do we do about that? What are the strategies? What are the accommodations? How do we help support for people that we do know when it is on our radar? Obviously, one of the first things we have to do is get it on our radar. And that's, Judy can do a whole a presentation. Your team can do that on screening sometime. That's probably more than what we could do here. But let's say, for example, that it, we have some idea that there has been a hit to the head, whether it's a, a concussion, or whether it's severe brain injury, somewhere in there, it's likely that we're gonna see some physical sequelae. The most common ones that you see after a hit to the head is gonna be headache. Um, the other ones that, you, that we're seeing more and more of are ocular motor is eye tracking problems. And so um, people can see fine with, after having a brain injury, they can kind of read the eye chart but what their brain is processing 
is not, is the brain is having to work harder to be able to process the information that they're seeing. So that's an ocular motor problem. Um, and the same thing happens with auditory, where we're beginning, this is the brand new field of concussion, we're beginning to see that if you had a brain injury, you might be hearing just fine, but what your brain is recognizing in what you're hearing is a little bit off, and you have to work harder to be able to process what you hear. So auditory visual processing and auditory processing is just very taxing to the brain after any kind of a hit to the head, whether it's mild or severe. And that just then takes a lot of energy from people who are kind of struggling to do day-to-day -day tasks. Um, the other thing that we see a lot of is vestibular, so that's the inner ear canals, causes a lot of dizziness. So people with brain injury often report headaches, they report dizziness, they report that they are extremely tired, like they're not holding a charge, and it's because there's so much energy going to just processing the world. Um, the, so you kind of get a sense that these are the most common physical things that we see. The autonomic um, instability is that faintiness, so you feel like, especially when you get up from a sitting position, you feel like you want to fall over and faint. That's what that is about. How long after you have the uh, and traumatic brain injury, does this stuff happen? Like right away are you feeling these or? Generally, it's, it's pretty right away. And you feel the most pronounced right after the hit to the head. Um, you, might not hit, you might not feel it right away if you don't tax the brain. So you, if, if you don't feel anything at all, perhaps the first day you go back to work and then you add back in all of the processing you have to do at work, you start to flare these symptoms. How long will these last afterwards? That's the big question with brain injury. Um, with, if we can <coughs> rehab these with vestibular physical therapy, they tend to go away. If we don't rehab them, they tend to get better on their own, but you can still see remnants of it for a long time afterwards. So you hear people who have had a brain injury years before and they're saying, I still get dizziness. I still have trouble when I move from sitting to standing. Um, because these, you know, they don't impact your life so that you can't work at all, but you can feel them. So, so the, the physical symptoms are things that we can actually rehab with physical therapy. There's lots of new interventions for this. And for those of you that are working with, you know, colleagues who might have dizziness or trouble orchestrating everything, there might be some physical therapy that could help. Or, you know, for any of you guys, you know, that you're talking about in personal situations. Mm -hmm. And are you going to get into preventative strategies later? Because I have some questions on, on that. Uh, I don't really have that in this talk, but we can talk about, if we have time at the end, maybe okay. we'll talk about that. Okay. Um, so the treatment for this is there's a lot of do support at work, support at home, um, support at school, cutting down some of the demands, and doing some therapies and time. So this is how we deal with the physical sequelae of of any kind of a brain injury, whether it's mild to severe. The, the uh, impact on learning is um, what the uh, Department of Education is working a lot on in terms of helping our school districts help our kids. And they have come up with this, what we call the building box. So basically, the hierarchy of all of our brain development starts with some foundational skills of attention, processing speed, sensory motor. Um, you know, if you have little ones at home, you see that they're, they're working on all of these things naturally. All, everybody goes through this process of learning these skills and then building on top of it. So if you can attend long enough and remember some things when you're two or three, you begin to learn language and learning and then you know how to behave in certain situations and then how to achieve at school. So this is what everybody goes through in terms of how our brain develops. When you, and we want, these things to build um, with the complexities build over time um, and with age. And so therefore, if you take this model, and this is the model the Department of Education has, has worked with and has now been applied to domestic violence situations or to juvenile justice or to criminal or to prison situations, you take this as just kind of your model to start with and then you can see that if you have a brain injury, you're going to impact the building of some of these stronger skills eventually. So let's say, for example, you have a brain injury at the age of six and you're no longer attending as well. What's going to happen to the rest of your building blocks? They're going to kind of crash in. 
And so in terms of learning, trying to help somebody with a brain injury in their learning processes, we have to be very aware that we have to work, go back and work on the skill, de skill deficit of attention before we can really get this learning process to, to, to be as robust as other kids who are not dealing with brain injuries. You can kind of also apply this then to, you know, um, trauma situations, so kids that are really struggling at home for various reasons, not necessarily a brain injury, domestic violence situations, all kinds of things. So this is kind of the model that um, Department of Ed is working with schools on because if you can identify what the skill deficit is, you can go back and help support that and shore that up a little bit and help make learning a little bit stronger. So that's the learning issues post brain injury is another thing that we work on. Um, and so I just picked a few of them out just to kind of give you a sense. Looks like these got a little mixed up, but the most common ones that you see with a brain injury is some difficulty with attention. And so impaired attention makes the kid have difficulty sitting still and all of that. And then, then if you can figure that out, you can put accommodations in place for attention. Processing speed issues are kind of the other most common thing that you see. People are learning, but just not learning as quickly. Okay. And then so therefore, here are accommodations for processing speed. And then the same thing for memory. So if you can drill it down to where you think the problem might be, you can then find ways to support it, um, either in a work setting or in a school setting. And then, of course, the big question that we always get that happens post-brain injury is how, how is this impacting their behavior, their emotional well-being? We see more depression. We see more anxiety. We see um, kids who don't necessarily can't stop themselves and make better choices. And so that's kind of falling in this category here of social, emotional, and executive functioning. And so therefore, we use the same kind of um, building block <coughs> to help schools just take a look at it from a different perspective versus you know a kid instead of just saying this kid won't behave for me perhaps this child has an attention issue now has a memory issue has a skill deficit issue as a result of the brain injury as a result of trauma in the family or whatever and you can drill it down support them by teaching rather than just kind of assuming that um, that they, they they have the skill but they won't do it so we're really using those are the most common things that you see post-injury, the physical, the learning, the emotional, and behavioral, and this is kind of the way that we are handling it. So it just gives you many more strategies when you're working with a child or you're working with an adult with work situations where if the behavior that you're starting with um, might be aggression, you might then consider where this might be coming from and maybe it relates back to the brain injury and you can then support it. So you can see that you have many more options in teaching skills versus then just consequenting. So that's kind of the function of it. So the, I'll kind of end on this piece, which is that um, the hard part, and I think this is where we started from, is while all concussions are brain injuries, not all brain injuries start as concussions. So, but I think the research is beginning to say that we need to be aware of people who have concussions that don't get better over time. So perhaps here's the injury, and then the symptoms go on for a longer period of time. The hard thing that we have to figure out is, is that really from the brain injury or the concussion? Or is that just something that would pop up later? Some people get headaches later in life. Maybe that wasn't from the brain injury, but maybe it was. Some people have memory problems <coughs> later in life. Maybe that was from the brain injury, maybe it wasn't. That's so that's the hard yeah. thing to figure that's out. That's what I'm wondering yes. because, yeah, because then like when I became a teenager or early teens or whenever, I started getting migraines all the time. Right, so then, exactly. <laughs> I mean, I never, my parents never even talked about the, right. the concussion stuff, but right. it's just, I, now that yes. I'm, into, I'm like, was that yeah. all part of that? And, you, and no one will ever know no. for sure, but as long as you have had a concussion, in, it's always in the back of your mind, right? Is that related to the fact that I'm getting headaches now later in life? That's the hard part of figuring all this out. Um, but I guess my advice on this is that it's all a continuum. So if you say, I, I have this question of concussion later in life, or early in life, mm -hmm. people will say, well, it's likely that that's not why you have headaches now. Right, right. But if you do have lingering symptoms over time, and you think maybe it is, whether or not we ever know it came from a concussion 
or multiple concussions or sub-concussive right. blows, at some point it's good to know and at some point we don't need to know. We just do the same kinds of interventions there and those interventions are in the world of brain injury. So if we pursue those, there's still a lot of support for you. So that's kind of, you know, um, that why we want to keep it kind of all on the same continuum <coughs> and not necessarily keep it a category of concussion versus brain injury because we don't access the same kind of supports from the brain injury world that we do with concussion, but we can if we kind of keep it all kind of thinking about what can we do on the skill deficit side and just build up memory or attention or whatever it is. So that's, and that quote comes from your fearless leader here. Um, <laughs> so in terms of resources, we will have our colleagues um, that are here to tell us about some of the resources that if you kind of keep an open mind about, um, you know, not just a concussion clinic, but what do we have in the world of brain injury, there's a lot that we're trying to mix together to support everybody. And then maybe at the end we'll have some time to talk about prevention. Okay. Okay. You guys are gonna do about 20 minutes? Uh -huh. Yep, we'll have about 10 minutes for questions okay. at the end. Okay, all right. <coughs> okay, so we will, thank you. Hello, thanks for coming. I'm uh, Heather Hotchkiss, I'm at the Department of Education and I work in the Exceptional Student Services Unit. So I'm in the special ed and gifted world, um, but my main um, focus is special education. And, um, and, and being a brain injury specialist, obviously um, in the Department of Ed, as far as Colorado goes, we are very, very, very lucky because of your fearless leader, um, that we have this partnership and have brain injury specialists at the Department of Education level because many states don't. So actually no other states do. So that truly focus just on brain injury. They're kind of tucked under other um, areas. But And I'll let Janet um, introduce herself when she comes up. We're gonna split this time. So I'm just gonna be talking really quickly about some of the things that's going on at the Department of Education. Um, my background is, is mental health and special education mainly um, for many, many years um, doing that world and in, at the State Department of Education in uh, a couple of districts here in the metro area um, as special ed coordinator, um, school social worker, as well as special education director. Uh, and now back at the Department of Education as a brain injury specialist. The other hat that I wear at the Department of Education um, and that I, that I have a little bit different viewpoint uh, with regards to brain injury is I'm on, I can also work on the uh, congenital side, so fetal alcohol spectrum disorder or substance exposed newborns, I also get involved with, so that um, would not be considered that acquired brain injury category that Karen um, so eloquently covered um, as far as the category. So we do um, <laughs> a lot at the Department of Education under the acquired brain injury umbrella and uh, as far as traumatic brain injury, that specific type of traumatic brain injury um, by, the, by very definition, we didn't adopt a traumatic brain injury special education category until five years ago here in Colorado. Uh, the, the definition has been on a federal level since <coughs> early night, since 1990-91, uh, but we didn't go there specifically in Colorado because we have to do everything different, as you know, working for the state government in, in Colorado. So we, um, we had it under in a, in a different category of physical disability and had lots of other um, areas and, and health conditions included in there. So when we pulled it out, um, specifically as a standalone uh, TBI special ed category, that's when we really got into really focusing on how do we support school teams in doing this, knowing what a brain injury is, knowing how it affects learning, and knowing how it affects um, life in general for kids. So during that time frame, uh, and, and Dr. McAvoy and Judy Detmer were very uh, instrumental in, in that time frame of creating that criteria, um, we wrote a manual here in Colorado, and so we have an 80-page manual. It's actually currently under um, revision right now. It, looks like it's gonna be larger than 80 pages, which I'm not happy about, but it, it <laughs> still is gonna be what it's gonna be. And it's a, it's a great resource, it's free, it's available for download on the website. Um, but we do a lot of training around eligibility and how that criteria really 
um, looks in schools and supporting uh, school teams. Um, <laughs> we also have various websites um, that we do. The Building Blocks of Brain Development, um, Karen's, your, were, your slides were old. It still said Hierarchy of Neurocognitive Development. We've changed the name because Hierarchy of Neurocognitive Development is pretty wordy and, you know, what does that mean, right? Um, to the Building Blocks of Brain Development. So that whole model, that whole uh, framework is one that we do a lot of training on and we train our um, school teams on to make sure that they have the, the tools. Um, we will also talk about Brain Steps Colorado, which are school consulting teams uh, for brain injury, and we'll also talk about concussion management teams and some resources. So you've seen this, this is the building blocks, and it really does align um, with the eligibility criteria for TBI and um, the definitions of cognitive and behavioral impact, so all of these building blocks in and of themselves um, by way of just brain development as well as uh, issues when brain injury happens. So it's a really nice model that takes the effects of brain injury and the brain development notions as well as formal informal assessments uh, to, to take a look and really understand where a child or, or young adult is functioning across those and then strategies and interventions are aligned um, right with those. So it's a really nice um, kind of framework that, that we can give school teams. Um, Brain Steps Colorado is a uh, school con consulting model out of Pennsylvania. They've been doing it for over a decade now. And um, we've had, historically in Colorado, we've had brain injury resource teams for many, many years in uh, Colorado. But we went, in 2016, we went to this formalized Brain Steps model. It was um, kind of shoring up the way teams um, get trained and how they function. and. Um, referral processes and all of those kinds of things. So uh, we were really able to support teams um, more uniformly within this model. So, um, so we were able to take all the good stuff that all the other states had done as well as what Colorado had put in place and meld it all together and um, adopt the Brain Steps model. Um, so we do have um, a great partnership with MindSource, obviously. Um, there is funding that goes um, between the Department of Education and MindSource uh, and that helps fund this particular program for sure. So Brain Steps stands for Strategies Teaching Educators, Parents, and Students and um, it is an interdisciplinary consulting team model. So we have um, more, actually I think I've got it in here, we've got 17 uh, school districts and four BOCES uh, involved. So. Um, so the team members, we really do want to take a look at who's, who's got an interest, who's got a desire, who's got passion in this area. They, a lot of times there are personal um, you know, experiences that come to light, of course, within um, the world of brain injury. And, um, and we, get, we actually have a formal apl application process for applying to make sure that they've got the right makeup of the team they've got the right um, support to make that uh, successful team in their school district. These are the various uh, folks that we would like to have on every single team. Not every team is created of all of these folks, obviously, and um, the structures that we have in Colorado uh, lend itself differently depending on which area uh, or community you live in. And so many school districts do have each and every one of these, but some don't. Uh, and if you're familiar with schools in Colorado, we also have BOCES, which are Board of Cooperative Education Services Centers, which um, are kind of a special education umbrella over several different dis districts. So the special education processes and uh, um, supports and personnel are really covered by the BOCES, but they're individual districts, um, the way that those services look. So it's, it's uh, a little bit different depending on where you are. What but is that these dark purple? I'm sorry? Yeah, yeah what's the dark purple? <coughs> this one? Yeah. Speech therapist, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so speech language pathologists are um, absolutely key in those uh, teams. So we, again, can support these teams um, uniformly across um, training and supports. Um, not only Dr. Tyler and I at the Department of Education, but I also. <coughs> Um, Karen talked a little bit about it. Um, I 
can contract with a couple of people, Karen being one of them, um, to help support and train and coach um, uh, these teams across our state as well. So we have ongoing consultation um, and mentors in place for that. We do meet regularly uh, with folks across the team to make sure that they're supported. So the types of services that the Brain Steps teams do um, are, are varied also. Um, so we can coordinate, they can coordinate school reentry from a hospital setting or a rehab setting. Um, they can take a look at any kinds of strategies, suggestions for the school team to implement within a school building or a classroom setting. Um, they can do observations, really look at behavior and drill down um, when you think about those building blocks. Is it really a behavioral issue or is it a skill set um, that's missing or a gap that's there and, and make sure that we're really identifying thoughtfully um, the way we need to intervene with a particular student. Um, and then the monitoring, we do have a database um, set up that all teams can, can utilize and that really um, makes it an automatic uh, follow-up possible so that a six month uh, you know, follow-up email can be sent to the team lead to say, you know, this student, you've not really had to work with them in the past, but they're looking at a transition from fifth to sixth grade or whatever and so maybe we want to check back in with that that school team so and uh, parents so lots of uh, different types of uh, supports can be provided um, who can be referred um, and this is all acquired brain injury so not just traumatic brain injury but non-traumatic brain injury we didn't talk about non-traumatic brain injury much but um, that would be kind of an internal event versus the external blow uh, an internal event like a brain tumor or, or an infection that causes brain um, function differences, et cetera, et cetera. So there's, um, some, there's, there's two different types of acquired brain injury that can be referred to the, um, to the brain steps team. Um, and of course, we're always looking at the difficulties with functioning. So it, brain injuries can't, obviously can, res can resolve and you don't need any support. So we don't need to pay any attention to those kids because they're doing well. So how, how do we really um, make sure that we're identifying that well and, the, and what those difficulties are? So many people can make student referrals uh, to the Brain Steps team. Right now, since <coughs> this Brain Steps model is only a couple of years old here in the, the state, uh, we have uh, the capacity to open it up wider than what we currently have referrals coming in. Right now, we leave that to Brain Steps teams as to how they're marketing their team, when they're ready for referrals, how they're getting it out to all of the principals and administrators across the district, as well as parents uh, and community members. Uh, but any one of those folks um, can make a referral um, and, um, and at least have a communication. It doesn't have to be within the database because there is an electronic referral that, that is a part of that, but it, it can also be just word of mouth and, hey, this kid, what did you do here, kind of a thing, and we can get them involved into that program for sure. Um, so we started this again in 2016, and we had um, 13 districts and four BOCES um, total, and then we added to that last year, or. 2017-2018 school year, which is this year, so last fall we added to um, that, that number. Uh, and each year we will be adding more and more um, uh, and do, and the, the fall, each fall we train new teams and new team members to current teams, uh, and then everyone comes back for a follow-up training in the spring, and so those are growing exponentially, as you might imagine, as we add new people and new teams to the uh, project um, and I just added up the numbers um, and and we're at about we have brain steps teams um, able to service about half the kids in Colorado with all of the districts and the, the geography and the number of students that those teams serve we have about half the kids covered across the state uh, obviously we want that to grow uh, and we are doing that every year. So if you guys know of a school district that doesn't have a team um, or want more information, happy to, to share that and how that, what that process looks like. 
Oh, so here are the school districts and the BOCES that are uh, currently in our Brain Steps project. Um, and again, hoping to add to it at each, uh, each year. And this is how it looks across the state as far as coverage right now. Um, with regards to districts or BOCES, the, the BOCES are the green uh, and the school districts that are a little bit bigger um, are the yellow. So I'm going to turn it over to right on time wise <laughs> to my colleague to finish off. So I have a quick four minutes to tell you about the concussion management team. And um, I'm, I'm talking very short time because I obviously have a cold and so I'm not talking much. But I'm Janet Tyler. I um, at the, am a brain injury consultant at the Health and Wellness Unit of the Colorado Department of Ed. And before I forget, over on the back table are our um, brain stiff steps little swag that we're giving out and, and they're little smelly brains and so I didn't want to put them out on the table if you because you a lot of you were eating lunch but you can hang them in your office or your car or whatever you want but it has our website up so um, not only do we have the brain steps teams and those are the interdisciplinary consulting teams and those are at the district level or the BOCES but then we have the concussion management teams and these are at the building level and so these are going to be taking care of the, t the kids for the first four to six weeks after they have a concussion because we know that we have lots of kids are having concussions and so they're going to kind of take care of those kids in-house and then um, they'll hand them off to the brain steps teams. So we know, as Karen had said, 70% of the kids during the first four weeks recover. And so we wouldn't want to be sending those to our um, brain steps teams because they'd just be inundated with you know districts full of kids. And we know that um, while an athlete has to be 100% um, symptom free to return to play, our kids don't have to be 100% <coughs> symptom free to return to learn. So these kids are coming back to school and they're still going to be having problems. Um, so we know that the research says that they should just rest for a short period of time at home, 24 to 48 hours, and then they should be back in school. So if they're back in school and still having problems, that we should be making some academic adjustments for them. And so this is what the concussion management team is going to be helping in the building, helping um, to adjust for them. So we know that academically accommodated students should um, be recovering <coughs> faster, they're going to be having less anxiety, and so if we do this, that they should be um, experiencing lower stress and not fall behind in classwork. If they go back in and people are expecting them to do everything that they would before, then they're going to have anxiety, they're going to maybe say, I can't do this, they're going to stay home, and then they're just going to be way far behind. So what our concussion management teams do, that they work with the medical doctors, they work with the school team and the family and, um, to support the individual students. So they're going to um, monitor the students' academics as well as the symptoms when they return to school following that concussion. So our concussion management team have a minimum of two people. It's going to be a symptom monitor and an academic monitor. You can have lots more people on the team, but you're going to have those two people. And usually the symptom monitor is somebody like the school nurse, but it could really be anybody. And the academic monitor could be somebody like the school counselor. And what they're going to do is they're just going to monitor once a week using a form that we give them, asking the student what their symptoms are, how they're doing, and then the academic monitor is going to work with the student's teachers and find out how they're doing in individual classes. So this concussion management team, it doesn't take the place of the bigger concussion management team like the medical and the parents and everything, but they're really the information gatherers, the data collectors because we want to make sure that we're making these decisions based on data. So concussion occurs, your first layer of support is that building level team. Student generally 
you know, recovers in that first four to six weeks, we're putting in academic adjustments based on what the student needs, based on the data you're collecting, and then, you know, generally students recover. If that student doesn't recover, then we're going to make that referral to the Brain Steps team. If the district doesn't have a Brain Steps team, you're still going to have data and you're going to then make um, a referral to like the student <coughs> assistance team or whatever in your district. So how we train these concussion management teams, instead of like how we're training the Brain Steps teams, we do that in person. Um, this is an online course that we have set up. It's 5.5 hours of online videos um, intermixed with uh, quizzes and um, activities. And then they download this concussion toolkit, which is actually the forms that they use to monitor. And then when they um, finish this, they'll receive a, a certificate, so they get credit hours for that. And then they're recognized as a concussion management team. And then we hold monthly calls with these folks so they can ask questions. Um, we give them updated information so they're always kept current. So here you have your district-wide teams. They're consulting on all the brain steps teams are consulting on all levels of um, brain injury and acquired brain injuries. And then the concussion management teams are at the building level teams. Um, so those two teams aren't the same. And um, another partner that we work with, wanted to mention quickly, is the Brain Injury Alliance. And they really help us out because they do case management. So at the Colorado Department of Ed, we don't do individual case management or individual consultations on any students. Um, but they are a wonderful partner with us because they can help parents out in terms of doing case management on a student. And they will help with um, finding community resources for a student. They will actually attend an IEP for a student. Um, so we can make referrals in, um, to the Brain Injury Alliance and they can provide educational support. So they are always a great resource too um, for those of you who are parents. Other brain injury resources I want to leave you with are Colorado Kids. Um, with brain injury. It has great sections for professionals and for parents. It's loaded with information on concussions. Uh, it has the whole section on the building blocks where you can look at a specific um, area and it goes into that. And then here are each of our, um, Heather's and my, web pages at the Colorado Department of Ed.